doing that. All right, uh, so um, it's my distinct pleasure to present to you Pat Benikovic, who is the old coordinator of European Students for Liberty. He is also a student of faculty of philosophy um, in, on the University of Belgrade. Except that he also works for <clears throat> a Serbian think tank called WIPEC, which many of you have hopefully heard of. And today he's going to speak about a beautiful topic and a more beautiful plan. Um, this is Radko Nikolic, and he's going to talk about marijuana prohibition and how the government is actually making the, making the situation far worse than it should be. So, please. Uh. Um, I'd like to uh, begin my presentation with a short video. Uh, murders, uh, rapes, uh, insanities, and suicides. 
all these that were actually arguments used when it was in the late 1930s first outlawed on federal level in America, in the United States of America. Well, all of these were relevant arguments, and well, since uh, from from what I've heard from you, that's all just a bunch of lies. That's uh, that, whose uh, point is to uh, probably uh, everything else but to make a sensible drug policy from which the whole society would profit. So, from these two dreadful conclusions, uh, other questions arise. So, if it doesn't work, why is it still in place? I'm talking about the prohibition. What is it? What, what is its real goal? Who profits from it? Who bears the consequences? What keeps it going? Like, and what can we do about it? In the next 20 to, to 20, 25 minutes, I will be trying to address these questions, and I hope that you will help. Uh, excuse me for uh, concentrating on the marijuana prohibition in the United States, but that was sort of well easiest for me because. Uh, there is the most data on the internet and it's uh, mostly, uh, most easily accessible. So, I'll start uh, by giving a short intro for the, the mi minority, a very small minority in this uh, room that hasn't tried marijuana and for those who for some reason don't know what it is. Then I'm going to try to give a uh, short history of its use, the known use in a known history case. Uh, and uh, then give the context in which prohibition starts, in which marijuana first uh, becomes illegal in the first place, and then, well, basically ask you guys what, 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 what is the best way to, to solve the current situation. So, according to Wikipedia, Cannabis or marijuana, or wheat, pot, herb, grass, Mary Jane, Dega, Dope, Bang, Aunt Mary, Skunk, Boom, Gangster, Keith, Gadger, Hashish, <laughs> is a product of cannabis sativa, also known as hemp, and it's intended to be used either as medicine or as a psychiatric drug. Having said that, it's important to mention that hemp, as is, has many, many other uses except for these, and it can be used in textile, construction, military, and various other industries, and has over 25,000 uh, pro different products that, that can be made for, about it. So, get back to uh, marijuana. The main psychoactive ingredient, the, the one that makes it so sinister, I mean, marijuana is THC, or tetrahydrocannabinol, and it's one of the, only one of the 483 uh, components of this plant including 84 other cannabinoids with various other, various other effects on human body and mind so, among which some research say are, are also cure, curing cancer and various other terminal and non-terminal diseases such as HIV, glaucoma, multiple sclerosis and other. The desired effect, uh, according to Wikipedia again, of consuming cannabis are General alteration of conscious perception, euphoria, feeling of well-being, relaxation or stress reduction, increased appetite, increased appreciation of humor, music or arts, metacognition, introspection, and enhanced the recollection of like, episodic memory, increased sensuality, increased awareness of sensation, increased libido and creativity. And among the non-desired ones are decreased in short-term memory, dry mouth, impaired motor skills, reddening of the eyes, and feeling of paranoia and anxiety. Some people, although this is not proven, connected to uh, what they call a motivational syndrome, and even uh, to some psychosis, psychosis like uh, schizophrenia and depressive disorder. But this has not only not been confirmed, but also there are researches that, that show completely the opposite, that uh, marijuana actually helps in solving problems that are caused by these diseases. Um, although marijuana uh, has been widely known and in the political discourse maybe from the 1960s when it was brought into our attention by the countercultural movements and the fact that it began, uh, it became, uh, uh, started being used by upper and uh, middle classes which made it a, well, a relevant political issue. It's actually, uh, it has a history of, well, probably being used since the beginning of mankind, but uh, well, from what we have documented at least 5,000 years ago. First, it was used by, uh, by nomadic tribes in Central Asia when it was brought to uh, China, and we have an ancient Chinese medicinal text 
uh, describing a mixture of uh, cannabis and wine called Mayo uh, that was used uh, as a, a medication for conditions like gout, menstrual med problems and rheumatism, as well as anesthetic. Then we have those nomadic tribes bringing cannabis to India, where it's uh, associated with the holy, uh, holy plant Soma. It's not, it's not certain that marijuana was Soma, it, it, we don't know what it actually was, but it's, it's a quite good possibility that it was cannabis. And used uh, for uh, very different, different uh, things. For example, uh, as bank, sort of a uh, drink made of marijuana, used uh, for religious purposes and as gaja or shalas, which is like hashish, used as means of reaching transcendence. Also, uh, usage of hemp and it's uh, for economical purposes is also documented from this period. Uh, furthermore, with migrations of the aforementioned tribes, uh, marijuana moves west and in the 5th century BC, Ancient Greek historian Herodotus, like the father of history, speaks of steam baths used by Scythians, the Iranic tribe that lived between the Black and Caspian Sea, and well, you probably figure out what kind of steam that was. Anyway, during the Middle Ages, uh, the, main, uh, the main motor for uh, spreading, uh, uh, spreading uh, cannabis further west was Islam and uh, well, its expansion to West as uh, well as alcohol is forbidden by Quran. Well, that was uh, their main uh, main way of relaxation. And cannabis appears in many uh, many texts from Islamic uh, writers, including uh, the One Thousand and One Nights and other stories like the story of uh, Hassan ibn uh, Saba and his assassin appears. His assassin also appeared. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, point a few lines. It's, it's one of the first stories that actually got marijuana its, it's a bad reputation. It's a story of uh, this uh, Ibn Hassan Saba, that was, uh, the, uh, this was the leader of, I think, Nazir sect of uh, all Islam. And uh, the idea was that he would uh, give his uh, men a lot of hashish and then he would take them to uh, a garden with prostitutes and they would have all the fun they, they want for a limited amount of time and then he would deprive them of all these profits and then uh, ask them to do murders for him and of course knowing how, how well, good the award is they were the most bloodthirsty assassins ever and uh, that's, that's uh, the legend says that the word assassin actually got out of this, this story also as I said one of the um, one of the first uh, stories that give, give uh, cannabis bad reputation. Anyway, although Europeans are in constant contact with Islam during uh, crus crusades from the 19th century and during trading, well, for the whole period since then, no, generally to, to trade, hemp uh, starts being grown in the West only from 15th and 16th century, where, where it's discovered, uh, where it's uh, Application in uh, military and shipbuilding it has been discovered basically for making ropes. Uh, the Puritans bring it to the New World, and the first, first, uh, the first law concerning marijuana in the territory of the United States is ironically not the one prohibiting it, but making farmers grow it in order to send it back to England. And it was uh, in uh, 1619 in the uh, Jameson colony. So uh, around around that time in uh, 1640, uh, it's uh, marijuana starts being mentioned in medicinal uh, encyclopedias such as Culpeper's Herbal, and it starts being associated with uh, healing many many diseases. Uh, in the middle of 19th century, after Dr. William uh, Brooke or Shognessy uh, wrote a review of Indian usage of cannabis, where he encouraged its use for uh, treating pain, uh, muscle relaxation, spasm, and other uh, other uh, other problems. Uh, marijuana gets into medicinal mainstream and. Uh, the, a lot of doctors are inspired to, to uh, experiment, with, experiment with it, so it's used for treating asthma, migraine, cough, menstrual pain, 
insomnia as well as uh, curing the opiate addiction. So, between the middle of the 19th century, when it is in the medicinal mainstream and when there is no doubt that it has uh, a, med a legitimate med medicinal application, and 1937, where uh, Marijuana Tax Act is uh, voted, that uh, forbids uh, marijuana on the federal level in the United States. Well, what happened? How, 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 was it, how, did it, uh, how did it make its transition from being viewed as a medicine to being viewed as a poison? And, well, there is no definite, definitive answer to this, but some idea is that uh, the, 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 this transition started when marijuana was actually uh, started being connected with uh, marginal social groups that used it in their cultural practices. Namely, with black uh, African-American musicians, with uh, African-American uh, workers, and with uh, um, Mexican workers in the south, southeast, uh, the southwest of the United States. So, uh, racism that's sort of inherent to the south, south, southern parts of, um, of uh, United States of America, alongside with the they took our jobs mentality, uh, gave birth to a series of uh, racist, uh, false, sensationalist articles about marijuana being connected with rapes, murders, uh, violence, uh, acting like a maniac, and stuff like that. And it was this propaganda that actually brought a series of uh, series of prohibitions in the southern states during the tens and the twenties. This is uh, the point where I would like to uh, mention, I would like to point out one, one peculiarity of the prohibition. Well, it's not really uh, directed against, against the drugs or the use of drugs, but it's uh, directed against the people who use a drug. And uh, as, um, as uh, some people say, like if uh, uh, opiates, namely opium, was legal due to most of the 19th century, when grandmas used it for their back pain, uh, or women used it for their menstrual pain and stuff like that, so nobody wanted to make it illegal because nobody wanted to see this, this social group in prison. However, when it comes to when it comes to Mexicans who have to take our jobs and uh, to black people who are all well, for some reason hated. Uh, we we'd, uh, we'd want to see them in prison a lot more, and we kind of outlaw what they use. That's the first one. Uh, that's the first point I'd like to make. And uh, another argument that goes in, uh, sort of, and follows in this point is the fact that uh, marijuana, well, in the 1930s, it's, it's associated with uh, violence, rapes, murders, and that's how it gets outlawed. But after, uh, when, when, the first, uh, when the Second World War starts and uh, the, the government needs hemp well, for its war efforts, what happens is they encourage it and they make counter propaganda to actually encourage it. And then when the war is over and they want to outlaw it again, knowing that, uh, I mean, uh, people already learned that uh, that's an absolute lie, that it encourages murders and rapes and just makes you passive and pacifist. They change it in order to say, no, now, now cannabis is actually a tool of the communist to make, make, make us Americans uh, well, more, more prone to their ideology and, well, it makes the war effort a lot more easier for the Soviets. Uh, we go further and uh, we, uh, we come to the, the exact moment where uh, marijuana is actually uh, being outlawed. That is uh, 1937, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, Marijuana Tax Act. And it's a, it's a very, uh, very uh, funny fact that it's just four years after alcohol prohibition had stopped. Alcohol prohibition that was like from the beginning of it, and th th there was no doubt that it was absolute failure, that um, it had its consequences, and none of them were actually reducing the amount of alcoholics or reducing the supply and demand of alcohol. Its consequences were uh, developing a huge and um, quite organized network of organized criminal, uh, giving the police the authorities they never had, and uh, sort of also developing their structure, creating 
a huge unneeded bureaucracy that became sort of a mean to itself and various other problems. So here comes the second point I want to make about the prohibition. The structure that's supposed to enforce it is by no means a mean to uh, either I, um, a whole societal profit or some unreachable ideal, but a mean to itself. And this, is, this, this point is furthermore enforced when we look at the example of uh, Mr. Harry J. Ensnager, who was one of the main agents uh, in the fight against the prohibition of alcohol. Yes. And in 1930, he was placed as chief of newly founded Bureau of Narcotics, where he committed his life to making marijuana illegal, lobbied in front of Congress, ordered false, uh, false articles, and while probably had hung out with people, the kind of people that made, made the trailer, we just, um, that made the movie for which we uh, just saw the trailer. Uh, the idea is uh, that I, I, I wanted to actually kind of uh, read, you, read you some uh, parts of the articles uh, that were uh, considered as valid and uh, that were actually the ones that brought cannabis to be illegal. So it says, by the tons it is coming into this country, the deadly, dreadful poison that tracks and tears not only the body, but the very heart and soul of every human being who once becomes a slave to it in any of its cruel and devastating forms. Marijuana is a shortcut to insane asylum. Smoke marijuana cigarettes for a month and what was once your brain will be nothing but the storehouse of horrid specters. Hashish makes a murderer who kills for a love of killing of the mildest mannered man who ever laughed at the idea that any habit could ever get him. So, this is probably one of the more milder uh, articles because it was, in, uh, it was published in somewhat relevant newspaper, but imagine the sensationalist yellow newspaper, and then you will see uh, black, uh, I imagine, African Americans going and murdering and uh, raping every, everything that comes into their path, influenced, of course, uh, by marijuana. The biggest tragedy is that all of these arguments that, well, were based basically just in the imagination of Harry J. Anslinger and his uh, fellow men were, were the uh, legitimate arguments that led to the uh, enactment of uh, the Marijuana Tax Act of uh, 1937. Uh, the funny thing is that a representative of American Medical Association of William Drayton Woodward was present there and was objecting against all of these things, claiming that there are absolutely no evidence of any of it being true, objecting against the fact that Marijuana Tax Act was named Marijuana Tax Act, not Cannabis Tax Act, in, in, uh, with the clear intention of actually connecting this plant with the Mexicans who call it that way, which sort of reinforces uh, the, the first point I was making, that uh, it's, it's about actually attacking the social group and not the drug. Uh, and we, we come to the, the third point, which is that uh, the other factors which made Harry J. Anslinger and the likes of him uh, work in, uh, in favor of marijuana prohibition. It's his connection to synthetic fiber companies, DuPont, and many other pharmaceutical companies that sort of uh, give, give, us, give us a clear, clear idea of what the, uh, what the, the economic interest of uh, banning marijuana is. So, the, the, I, I would say that the third point is that prohibition is nothing but the mean of government-supported corporate interest in making government-supported monopolies, helping your cronies uh, sort of get, get, get the money, you get the power because, because of all the agencies you lead, and all of the effort that's required to maintain a meaningless prohibition. Uh, basically, with, with all these, with these three arguments that I spoke of, um, I, I already believe that uh, it's uh, it's clear that uh, the um, apparent. Um, the, the ex explicitly said uh, the goals of the prohibition, which are, well, improving the public health and safety and uh, reducing uh, marijuana availability and, uh, well, its demand, 
are, are nothing but an ideological excuse for, well, basically, uh, securing power for yourself, pushing the interests of the corporate cronies, and uh, pers pers prosecuting social groups uh, you dislike. Oh. Uh, that's, that's the general uh, sort of context that uh, I wanted to tell you about, about uh, the Marijuana Prohibition. Uh, I mean, the, the context where, uh, of the time when it was enacted. And, well, I kind of wanted to open a debate of uh, what do you think would be the best, the best possible solution? I mean, over the country, uh, throughout the countries in the world, after the 60s, where uh, we actually reached mainstream uh, during the, through uh, the help of countercultural movements and the fact that, well, uh, white middle class and upper classes people also started using it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm going to say this again, I'm a bit nervous. Alright, so, the idea is, After the 60s and the countercultural movements, which brought marijuana into the political mainstream and uh, made it a relevant point of debate, uh, we have we have witnessed the increase of marijuana of support for marijuana legalization all over the world, namely in the United States of America. As the as the members, the previous members of those countercultural movements and their children are maturing and actually getting to political positions where they can all make consequences out of their convictions, uh, what we see is a uh, is a uh, process of uh, marijuana legalization gaining gaining support, and it was last year uh, that uh, it's, it, it, at least in the United States of America it reached its critical point and. Uh, uh, we, we had 58% uh, according to Gallup research of people who actually supported marijuana. That leads us to the conclusion that there is absolutely no better moment than to push, push the final push and legalize it everywhere. So, what I wanted to ask is, among all of the possible, all of the possibilities of marijuana legalization that we are seeing across the world, uh, marijuana uh, reform, Regulation reform, I'm saying. Um, from uh, just uh, removing the mandatory sentence through to decriminalization, to legalization of medicinal cannabis, and to, uh, I guess, regulated uh, distribution and or laissez-faire uh, model. I would like to ask you, so what do you think is the, is the optimal uh, choice for the future? So, please. Legalize everything. Legalize everything. Of course. Anyone disagrees? Uh, what do you mean by legalize everything? Like, uh, could you describe that model a bit uh, further? So, would you regulate it? Uh, have it taxed? Uh, no, taxation. <laughs> no taxation at all, of course. But I, I think that the right process is the one that Uruguay is doing at the moment. So, at the beginning, to have some kind of regulation in order to have a to establish a structure and then to decriminalize and uh, legalize it totally. <laughs> so uh, the, the process Uruguay is doing at the moment, and I don't know, is, is everybody familiar with it? Yeah, no. No? Okay. Um, so the price is fixed and you're only allowed to buy a certain amount, I think it's like 30 grams or so, 50 grams a month, so not that much. <laughs> At least I've heard that it's not that much. Um, and the price is fixed, and um, you have to be registered as a as a seller and as a grower and as a buyer. So this this is done in order to prevent um, mafia structures from from uh, coming up. Uh, but the goal is definitely to have it totally legalized in the long run. But in the beginning, to have it a little bit more regulated in order to have more structure in it. And I think that's the right way. Well, and I would say it's for every drug. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter which one. It's whether it be marijuana or cocaine or DMT or heroin or whatever. Thank you. Any other ideas? I, yeah. yeah. Me? You, you, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, would, I would agree, but I think the problem is also that if you if government legalizes some drugs and it writes, okay, we legalize this, 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 and this, and they can do, they can 
make it illegal in the next 10 years. So the problem is just to, to, to uh, probably write in the constitution that government is not, not even allowed to, to uh, make illegal certain substances, doesn't matter what's the, uh, what's the, how people use it in this matter, because th then you won't have the way that, that they can make it illegal again. A couple of years. Because as long as we live in a democratic society, uh, they will have to count votes off of the people who vote for them, and then maybe people would vote for someone else. And also that's the reason why weed is not legal yet in so many countries, because even though there are some politicians who smoke pot, like uh, Obama. Clinton, Obama, Bush, uh, they didn't want to legalize weed because they would lose a lot of votes of, of people who are against it, who never tried it or don't even want to know anything about it. Oh, I, I make like a distinction there. It is, uh, I think we should make a difference between what our ideal state of uh, regulation would be and what is uh, currently applicable. So what, is, what leads to sort of processual change towards what we need. And well, I'm a libertarian. I would say that it's uh, just uh, leaving it all to, to spontaneous interaction of uh, individuals. Yeah, I would think it would uh, produce the optimal results. But in order to sort of uh, reach this point, uh, yeah, we, we, we're dealing with uh, a bunch of different uh, cultural, political, historical contexts which do need different uh, solutions. Well, so the idea well, uh, is to spark the debate somehow. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, anyone familiar uh, with like, um, what, what do you think would be the, how do you like the idea of decriminalization? Sort of to, to, to give, a, give a definition of it. It's uh, basically, you, it, it, uh, it removes criminal penalty for uh, possession of small quantities of, for personal use. But uh, you will get uh, it will be uh, sort of uh, confiscated if the if the police uh, catches you, and it will be and you will be most likely fined. So, uh, what do you think? Do you think that is an improvement to what uh, we are having currently? Yeah. yeah. Well, it depends. For instance, in Berlin, I, I lived here for already two years, and. You can buy pot everywhere and no one will make problems with that, but uh, there are some countries in which probably even decriminalization will not make a difference because of the cultural background. So mm -hmm. policeman has a chance to find someone for possessing a pot, they will do it. But let's say in Berlin, the, the culture is, let's say policemen are totally cool with that because probably they smoke by themselves anyway. <laughs> I think I think I would actually agree with you. Um, the, all of the problems uh, marijuana pro uh, prohibition creates, like as um, labeled as unintended, unintended consequences, um, are basically also the inability to, to control uh, the, the the potency or the quality of the product, the inability to um, sort of have a safe transaction between the individuals, the incentive of the seller to kind of to cheat on you and stuff like that. I don't. I don't see them actually being uh, being solved by the criminalization. So, uh, frankly, uh, if I was asked, I would go for uh, well, a if in the context of Serbia, which I usually like uh, take as a context where I make my uh, thought experience experiments because I would like to be legal there. Um, it, it would probably be uh, uh, regulated, uh, legalized but regulated. Uh, no. yeah. But if you regulate it, man, all the corporations are going to take over. Right? Yeah, yeah that's, that, that might be, might be true. No, because corporations. Yeah. Uh, Maybe I could uh, read you some marijuana prohibition fun facts. 
That might be interesting. So, um, a surprise, surprise. And it's, um, so, um, the idea is let's, let's see how, uh, how failed uh, marijuana prohibition is, so that we don't think how failed this lecture is. Um, so it's uh, like, uh, the fact is that uh, it's, uh, they, they, the, the studies say that uh, uh, in 1937, when marijuana was actually outlawed, it was uh, 50,000 Americans who have tried it. And uh, in the, well, today, the estimates are saying 100,000 million. No, 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 uh, no it's, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. May I just quit here? So I, I would like to say that, yeah. Can we get a round of